<laughs> okay, Proverbs 10, 27. Sorry about that, guys. All right, so it says, The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. So um, as I was saying, uh, someone had made a reference to the fear of the Lord. Um, it's been years since I took some time to study it, so I'm just kind of going through every scripture on the fear of the Lord and now having the Lord just kind of develop this with me again. So what I want to do is I want to start kind of laying down what the Bible says about the fear of the Lord. So there's a lot of references to the fear of the Lord. It's actually what we would call a standard in Scripture uh, for wisdom, for knowledge. And we even find in Isaiah chapter 11, where it talks about the seven spirits of God, it says that the Son of God will delight in the fear of the Lord. And so we have to get a kind of a grounding on what is the fear of the Lord. Um, interesting enough, the, the way the word fear is used, I'm going to give you some references here. I found that in the Hebrew, not the Greek New Testament, but the Hebrew Old Testament, they developed the word more specifically. Most of the time, it's not that way. It's usually in Hebrew. It's not developed in the Greek New Testament. It's really developed. But it, at least in the Hebrew, they had spent a lot of time trying to develop this word. So let me kind of give you the root of the word. It's interesting, the root of the word has uh, several different meanings, but the way it would probably be demonstrated the best is the word awesome, um, fear, reverence, or worship. So it's interesting, the root of the word means awesome, uh, it means fear, it means reverence or worship. And a lot of times when you say, hey, what's the fear of the Lord? Everybody says, well, it means you're afraid of God or God is terrifying and so you have a fear. The way it's described here, I thought it was interesting that it said it's actually one of the foundations of the word is for worship. So it's saying that there's a way that God makes himself known which he describes as the fear of the Lord. And what it does is it produces an effect inside of you to see God the way he is and causes you to worship him and creates what's called reverence for the Lord. Now, have you guys ever thought about this? A lot of times we're trying to help people not be have the wrong type of the fear of the Lord to get them to have intimacy with the Lord. Well, it's kind of funny. The term the fear of the Lord is tied to the idea of intimacy. So once you experience the awe, the aweness of God, the being awestruck by God, all of a sudden his values become your values. The things that he longs for, you long for. The things that he doesn't like, you don't like. You find that what we call a uh, um, uh, impartation and a burning effect happens from the fear of the Lord. And what it almost would mean is it means that once God has made himself known to you this way, all of a sudden you don't want your life without him. And, and you begin to long for him in deeper encounters. And it's actually a lot of times people say, well, if I could just grow on the love of God, but the Bible actually gives a contrast that you need the love of God deepening and the fear of the Lord deepening in your life. It's, it's a contrast that the Scripture gives. So here, it's now telling us the fear of the law, Lord prolongs life. Well, what does that actually mean? Now, the word prolong here might carry the idea of more time, like you're, you, you get to live a longer life. It could mean that, but the way that the, the Hebrew is being used here, it's talking about a quality of life. So the fear of the Lord creates a quality of life that you cannot have without experiencing God's presence. And so this is interesting. There, there's two ways that life is described in both the Old and New Testament. There, it's one way is called the living the system of the world or the power of the flesh. And by living that way, it's like your life gets consumed, it goes very fast, and there's nothing you can really ground on and say there was significance to it. And, and the Bible describes that, that quality of life as fleshly. And what happens is if you live in that realm, you never get to experience what God had intended for life to be. And then you have th this idea of a zoe life or eternal life, the way the scripture describes it. And in the original language, it's actually talked about as a different level of existence. And this level of existence is kind of what you, it's like the atmosphere that you and I are breathing in the kingdom. And you have to know the Lord for this atmosphere, this, this oxygen that you're breathing to 
invade you. And what it does is it enhances everything in your life and gives you a different way to live, not just living in a fallen world, but what your value systems are, what is possible in the kingdom. You, you come into what's called reality, which I actually define that as miraculous living. And these are all considered a certain quality of life. And when it says here, the fear of the Lord prolongs your life, here it's talking about it gives you a quality of life you cannot have without this being in your life. And so I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but think of when you met the Lord, how your life and the quality of it changed. Now, I don't know if you guys are like me, how many of you met the Lord and then all of a sudden all this stuff started happening in your life and you were so focused on all the stuff happening, you didn't recognize the quality of life that Jesus revealed to you? And then you just started, well, how does, how does Jesus work in my life instead of, well, what has he actually done to me? What's changed in me? And, and why is, are these values in me? And he's describing it. Well, God has given you the fear of the Lord. Now, let's look at the second part. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. Now, I was in Pueblo, Colorado. I'm trying to remember... Gosh, it, it must have been a decade ago. I was in Pueblo, and we were going. Cliff and I were going down there doing monthly meetings in Pueblo, and um, we were at we were doing these small groups meetings in this house. And this will show you how important the teaching was. I was teaching on something, but I can't remember what I was talking about. Isn't that exciting? So I'm teaching on something, and we're just having a discussion back and forth about a certain scripture, and the presence of the Lord came so powerfully in the room that everybody fell on, the, on their knees. And without anyone saying, hey, how, what should we do while the presence of the Lord is here, everybody started repenting of all their sins they've already confessed. And, and the room itself got um, transformed by the fear of the Lord. And what was interesting about it was when God's presence comes and you get encountered by what's called the otherness of who God is, all of a sudden it shakes you free into reality. And then it also creates a longing inside of you. So once that happened and we all are repenting of our sins and we're all just being refi refreshed by the presence of the Lord, we, we couldn't stop talking about that for like eight months after it happened. It's like, was that a one-time thing or could that be a lifestyle in the kingdom? What, what is that? What was that experience? And it was a demonstration of the fear of the Lord. And this is interesting. I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but when Jesus talks about times of refreshing in the kingdom, I don't know how you guys view that. Some people think, well, that means rest is going to come or I'm going to feel joy. And I think the first foundation of um, times of refreshing is the fear of the Lord is given to us. It's, it's like a cleansing process that God releases inside of us. All right, let's look at the second part of this. But the years of the wicked will be shortened. So let's take the word wicked here. Um, again, if you guys have been with me, it's kind of interesting. We use the word wicked or evil or demonic, and we all think it means the same thing, but these are specific words in the original language. And so when they use the word wicked, it means an active Person. So it doesn't mean just people that are born in sin. It means that these are the people that actively choose to do wrong things. So when it uses that term, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. It's saying the people that aren't just born in sin and sin because of their nature, it's saying these people know it's wrong and they choose to actually actively do evil things. Now, isn't that interesting? In this proverb, it's like a scale is being put in front of you, and it's talking about types of lives. So you have all these people running around on the planet right now. You have people that are encountering the fear of the Lord, and their, their lives are being sustained by a quality of life. And then there are other people that are choosing to do wicked things, and now the Bible's saying, well, you're among them, but what is going on in their life? And the Bible's basically saying this, the years of the wicked will be shortened. Now, it's interesting. Again, this isn't a time statement in the original Hebrew. It actually is, uh, again, the idea of, isn't this interesting? It doesn't mean just a quality of life. It's defined specifically. 
It means that they are discouraged, they're grieved, they live in mourning, and trouble is their lifestyle. And so how is their life shortened? They're in everything that you and I were not created to function in. And they're living in that all the time. Um, I don't know if you guys ever notice this. How many of you kind of just go to grocery stores and watch people as you're shopping or go to the mall and just observe people? Do you, and do any of you ever do that kind of So three of you, good, all right. You know, sometimes you and I are so involved in the kingdom, we kind of assume everybody's having a happy life and stuff, but people that do not know the Lord, they, they are really looking for things. And, and you can see it almost on their face that life is like exhausting to them. They're, they're trying to find some well of refreshing. And we just assume they like that lifestyle. And the Bible's actually saying, no, that lifestyle that they're involved in, they're actually living under a cloud of discouragement and they don't know how to break out of it. Uh, and they're being consumed by it and, and they live in a valley of trouble. Isn't that interesting? And so now the Bible, not only is it giving a contrast here, it's trying to wake you and I up. Everybody's not just running around and having the same experience. The people that do not have the fear of the Lord in their life, they are experiencing a land of despair, and they do not know how to get out of it. In fact, uh, I don't know if you guys ever laugh at this stuff. Do you know how um, people that do not walk with the Lord, they talk about life and they just assume everybody has that life? It's like, well, my life's miserable, so yours should be miserable. Like, that's what it's all about. Well, as believers, God has given you an incredible contrast. He's saying, no, that's, that's not what your life is like. You have all these benefits because of God coming into your life. All right, I'm going I'm to tell one more. Um, periodically, uh, I don't know if you guys ever do this, but at a certain season of my life, when I moved from Colorado to Kansas City, I kind of went through a six-month period where the Lord just kind of told me, all right, for your sake, I'm going to let you experience the fear of the Lord so that you will not go into sin. Isn't that nice of the Lord? And I, and I thought, I don't know what that means. And what would happen is, when God would come and minister to me, I wasn't being bathed in love. I was actually experiencing what I would call the awe or the terror of the Lord. And what it would do, it would make me extremely uncomfortable when God's presence would come. I was like, how many of you have ever had that experience where you realize we talk about Jesus like he's your surf buddy in California most of the time, like let's go hang out with Jesus, right? And there is that relationship part of it, but there's another reality that he is actually the living God. And he's, you know, he really is who he says he is and stuff. And sometimes when he draws near and he does that, it, it causes people to like, wow, he is not who I thought he was. And when he did that to me, I remember telling Kelly one time, um, I said, you know, sweetie, I had this experience where I had a trance and then the Lord spoke to me and I said, I don't want to have that anymore. And she's like, why? And I said, because it's terrorizing. I, I mean, I don't know how to describe it. I know God loves me, but he's not like the way we describe him. He's a, this incredibly powerful being. And I, I, I don't sense him as being unloving or anything like that, but I also don't have a sense that I can just do whatever I want when he shows up. Do you, do you guys recognize that? Well, that's, that's God's blessing to bring the fear of the Lord to affect us. Uh, did you guys know that uh, there's this really neat experience in the Old Testament? I always do this as Bible trivia. I always ask everybody, how many people have heard the audible voice of the Lord? And everybody says 12, right? <laughs> well, in the Old Testament, between four to five million people heard the audible voice of the Lord. And isn't it interesting that the people that heard the audible voice of the Lord, God said, before I speak audibly to them, I'm going to bring the fear of the Lord over them so that they will obey me. Isn't that interesting? So when God wanted to give his presence to his people, he said, well, what I'm first going to do is I'm going to bring my awesomeness near you so that you won't keep going into rebellion. Remember what the children in Israel were doing? God delivers them, and the first thing they want to do is build a golden calf. And they want to start worshiping all this, the idols and doing all this stuff. And God says, look, I, I want you to be a holy people, so I'm going to intentionally bring my presence near you. 
before I speak audibly to you, and I'm going to let you experience what it's like to be near me. And remember, Moses didn't even want to go up the mountain. They were all shaking and trembling because of who God is. Well, that guy is still relating to us. Um, how many of you came from any type of Methodist background? Methodist or Nazarene or any of that kind of stuff? Or holiness, any of the holiness backgrounds? Did any of you come out of those backgrounds? Oh, okay. They love talking about the fear of the Lord, those groups. Uh, they do. And, and I, for the longest time, they talked about the fear of the Lord, and I actually had a reverence for the Lord and had no concept of the love of God. So when I was trying to get closer to the Lord, I was afraid of him all the time. Well, now we're on another extreme. We've taught so much on the love of God that we're over here, and now no one has a healthy fear of the Lord. And so God is trying to bring a balance back to that. God wants to restore reverence to his name. Did you guys sense that during worship? I just kept sensing waves of the uniqueness of God coming into the room. How many of you experienced that while we were doing this this evening? Well, God is trying to restore something to us. He's trying to get a people, you and I, that walk in what? A reverence or being awestruck by the presence of the Lord so that our life is marked by that. So would you guys pray with me just for a moment? Let's just pray and seek the Lord here for a sec. Well, Father, we want all of what you want to give us. So come. Bring your presence. We ask for a healthy release of the fear of the Lord in the midst of us, inside our own experience with you, Lord. And anywhere where there, our inheritance is being stolen from us, that our days would have your blessing on it because of your presence. Break the power of that right now in the name of Jesus. And I ask that you would draw near us right now and establish us in you. And I just bless your name, Lord. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. So, um, help me with your name again. Lance. Lance. Do you mind standing for a second? And kind of put your hands out like it's Christmas? All right. Um, yeah. <laughs> All right, so Holy Spirit, would you bring your, your love and your power around your son in the name of Jesus? So I know we talked before the service. I was standing here during worship, and the Lord, I saw the Lord come and put his hand on your head, and I was asking him, well, what does that represent? And the Lord said, well, he actually has an assignment for you out here, and, he's, and the enemy has been trying to resist it, and the Lord's going to break the power of that and raise you up in a leadership role that he's actually set apart for you. And I actually saw him grab you, and it was like he was lifting you up into the spirit realm, and he wanted me to just kind of lay this out to you. You have been flowing in words of knowledge, words of wisdom, discerning of spirits, dreams and visions, and it kind of like felt like it got shut down, and God is saying, no, I'm going to release that even in a greater dimension. So Holy Spirit, release that river inside your son right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I command the blessing of the Father upon you right now. And God has anointed you to speak for him to people in the streets, and, and you have a, what I would call a strong foundation in the word, and God has given that to you to pierce people. And I just command it to come forth right now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? As you're all just staring at me and I'm staring back at you, does anyone have anything? Okay. Um, if you're having, so I felt like the Lord was showing me someone's dealing with some kind of problem down the right side of their leg. Uh, I, it felt like restriction or something like that with a muscle. So when we break off into that group, if that's you, head on over there. Lord wants to minister to you. Does anyone have anything else? Any physical conditions or anything? Yeah. Uh, I don't know the results, but they fixed something on my skin. I hope they think it's not good. 
So you want prayer for that, obviously. Okay. All right. All right. Anyone else? Anything they feel like they got from the Lord? You guys are so fun. All right. So you guys ready? Would you stand? All right, so everyone that's been here and you've done this with me, the guys that are, have worked with me, so that's going to be over there, the section where we pray for healing. So if you need have any needs of healing, you're going to get in a circle with each other. Don't wait for someone to minister to you. Just start asking each other, what do you need prayer for? Invite the Lord, and let's pray for each other. If you need a prophetic word and you need to be encouraged by the Lord, just go over in that section and start praying for each other. All right? All right, so dispersed. If you guys want to get prayer, please go do that. And if you don't want to be in either one of those groups, just visit and say hi to each other. And that's where we're going to end up this evening. Okay?